When you work in education leadership, you don't get off at five o'clock. Your mind is always on the clock, thinking of ways to solve problems for your students, parents, and teachers. On the Clock is your go-to podcast to learn valuable insights from education leaders across the United States. I'm your host, Todd Dallas Lamb, former White House appointee to the U.S. Department of Education, and we are now On the Clock. Welcome back to On the Clock. I am your host, Todd Dallas Lamb, and today I want to talk about the subject of college and career readiness, which is a phrase that we all hear a lot in education. It, like in a lot of topics in education, sometimes we use these, these phrases so much that it's hard to even know what they mean anymore. My guest today, uh, Diane, you're uh, pioneering a new vision for education during uh, your 20 years as a co-founder and CEO of Summit Public Schools, a nationally recognized nonprofit that operates uh, schools in California and Washington. Diane developed a school model centered on real world experiences, self-direction, collaboration, and reflection, preparing all students to succeed in college, thrive in today's workplace, and lead a secure and fulfilled life. You are the author of Prepared, What Kids Need to Know to Be to Live a Fulfilled Life, uh, published uh, in a number of countries. Uh, you've been praised, I believe, by Bill Gates uh, as having one of the top books of 2019, and you've been on Good Morning America. So. Uh, Diane, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. I want to dive into your expertise today. I'm very glad to be joining you. Thanks for having me. So let me take a crack at giving you my, um, you know, cheap seat view, if you will, of of college and career readiness. It feels like in my lifetime, this topic became the topic of getting kids into college, we really became obsessed with that in the 80s and 90s, and I think even more so in the early 2000s as well. Uh, I, I, as you as you know, I, I actually work um, with a company as a client that is in the college and career readiness. And one of the things that I've noticed um, is, is that the leader, the leading company in this in this space for a long time was Naviance. Uh, which is a product that is still in many, many districts around the country. And I found out uh, a few years back that their philosophy when they first presented that product was to go to private schools, because, of course, private schools are sort of in the business of preparing students. They they make no bones about it. We're Mm -hmm. going to get you into a a college. And Naviance really uh, hit it out of the park with that community. So much so as, as schools, as public schools were vying for some of those students, public schools started buying Naviance as well. And, in, and to the point where, as of, I'd say, five, six years ago, it was more likely to see Naviance in a school than it was unlikely to see Naviance in a school. It was the uh, it was the rule, not the exception in public schools. And more and more, I, I'm seeing... In the, this mo this movement towards college preparation, you know, and they hide it. Sometimes I feel like they're hiding it with the word career. Yeah, I don't think we focus on career as much as we focus on college. And I do see that there is a movement in the last few years to to not just focus on high school students, but also middle and even elementary, ha- having them inculcated into that movement. So am I, is that about right? Is that about where we started with this movement and, and maybe put a little more sunshine on that for me? I think everything you've shared um, it resonates with my experience. I think maybe what I would add there a little bit is um, perhaps some of the the movement into the public school sector is, as you know, I come out of the um, part of my career has been in the charter school sector and for the last 20 years. And, you know, charter schools, many of them, like mine, were formed with the explicit mission of preparing every single student for college. And so I do think that for the last 20 years, you've had a significant number of schools that are being built and developed with the explicit mission of preparing kids for college. And those are public schools, of course. And so I do think that has driven a lot of um, what you're seeing in the public schools And, you know, many of these charter schools are K-12 schools in some configuration. And I think um, when you have something, you know, that you're driving for, I think the earlier you can start it, I think that's the mentality. Well, if if it's good to start it in 10th grade, well, then ninth grade will be better and eighth grade will be even better and seventh grade would even be better than that. And so I think you're that's part of the the March to the earlier grades. And, And I do think that there's some real wisdom in 
um, engaging in activities earlier in students' experiences that will help them later in their future. But I'm not sure it's platforms where they're searching for colleges. Uh, so I, I feel like we should break it down between two different types of students. And, and I have, uh, in my own family, we have those two kinds of, uh, of students in myself and my brother. My, my brother never really wanted to go to college. He was the kid that's probably never going to go to college. And I feel like in this movement of, of college-focused education in K-12, that's really not the right school for him. And in his own lifetime, he was fortunate enough to do what you almost never see anymore, uh, shop classes. Mm -hmm. um, that movement died. I mean, as, as we were focusing on colleges, we were defunding. Uh, the shop classes, the welding, the woodworking classes. And and by the way, those are two still, a master carpenter and a welder make a lot of money these mm -hmm. days, don't they? What, mm -hmm. what, what What is your sense about where we are for the, that student, for my brother? Um, well, I think this is a really um, opportune moment, actually. And this is one of the things that I want to work on next, which is, um, you know, I think you and I and most people think about school after high school as being college. And in our minds, we have these four-year colleges. You know, you go and you get a bachelor's degree of some sort and maybe you go on. What's coming online more and more and more are a whole bunch of different learning opportunities that are all different lengths. So six months, a year, two years, where you get different degrees than a, a bachelor's. You get a certification, you get a credential, you get a, you know, industry type of um, um, recognition. And, you know, your brother who was taking shop class, all of those, um, you know, in industries that you name do require some sort of certification or experience or apprenticeship or something like that. Those are becoming, I think, um, more plentiful now. I think there's a recognition for the need of them for a whole set of diverse interests and futures and all the roles we need in our country. And so um, I do think we're coming into an era where we are once again seeing all these um, opportunities, more than we've ever seen before. Um, they do mostly involve some learning after high school, but not in the way that we've all been focused on for the last 20 years. That is really confining, I think. You know, so I mentioned some of the meat and potatoes kinds of jobs um, from my childhood that, that still exist. Nursing is another one. Yes. Um, there are programs that that's a huge need in this country. I, but now, you know, I, I also think about some of the ed tech startups that I, I see coming out of the woodwork. And some of these guys are millionaires and they never finished college. They, they got plucked out of college. They had learned how to code well before college. In many cases, in one famous case with one of my clients, he coded a grade book, gave it to his high school, went off to college, turned around, and it had like 3 million users and yeah. it turned it into a $55 million yeah. acquisition. I mean, the, the, the new technologies are out there, and, I'm, I, and I know that schools are teaching STEM, but it seems like the, the, the ones that are really achieving in America are really doing STEM all on their own, are learning how to code by themselves without the use of, 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 of a K-12 program. I think you're right. I think um, I think more and more K-12 is trying to bring STEM into the curriculum. And, you know, STEM is a very broad uh, description, quite frankly. Yeah. I think we're probably a little bit better in K-12 at more of the sciences, you know, biology, physics, chemistry, et cetera. But I think on the technology side, it moves so quickly. I do think that K-12 really struggles to, to provide a meaningful engagement in schools I also think that any in-school program has to be paired with with industry and real world experiences and opportunities. And so we are seeing some of that again around the country where some there's some really inspiring schools that have deep connections with their community partners. And for example, in the case of the schools that I lead, the network that I lead, we have 200 community partners that we work with, where our students are spending, you know, a, a significant amount of their time in the community, working with community partners. I live in California. I live in the Bay Area. There's so many of those sort of career maps that you were referencing, cloud computing, cybersecurity, you know, there's a number of those um, that really allow people to come in at the entry level and work their way up to incredibly um, lucrative careers. And it's not just the engineer who's coding. There's a variety of um, opportunities in technology. 
you know, historically school was, um, it was, it was a nice thing to have mm-hmm. when, when schools got started in this country, you know, most of the, our population were agricultural focused on farming. Uh, the economy has moved so rapidly to mostly urban and suburban and, and with the, and with that, a changing economy that has gone from, you know, manufacturing to now, to now digital. And there's so many options that, that, a, that a school actually, it does make sense that they've moved this way. And a lot of people say, just teach reading and writing. Mm-hmm. Well, you really, to, to, to be a benefit to the community in your area, for example, your schools need to be producing in the Silicon Valley, people that are digitally advanced, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's, mm-hmm. that's sort of your effort. Now I want to move over. I want to move over to the, uh, to the other student that really wants to go to college. What, what are we, what mistakes are we making in, in getting them ready for college? I think there's a couple that I see um, it, because, uh, you know, not all four-year college uh, experiences are equal. And, you know, you and I are both reading the headlines. We understand there's a student debt problem in the country. The cost of college has risen so dramatically. The vast majority of people can't afford to pay it. So they're taking out significant debt in order to earn a degree. So that's one challenge. I think the other challenge is when they get out, their degree doesn't actually align with where they go into work. And so they're sort of overeducated, if if you will. There's only 18% of people in this country who are working in a job that actually requires their degree, their college degree, believe it or not which is insane. You know, you, you put all of this expense into something that it doesn't actually isn't required and isn't used in your job. And so um, I think one of the mistakes we're making is not helping high school students sort of discover what is your best for your college option, not only the college, but the major, the program, the return on investment, we don't teach kids about ROI. Um, and I think that's the mistake that we're making. We sort of are like, oh, you, you can kick the can down the road and four years later, figure out what you want to do with your life. And you, you know, sort of go to this very expensive country club for four years, right? <laughs> and and you come out with a degree that is a good signal for a first job, but it doesn't mean that you, you, you've kind of overpaid for that signal in a lot of ways if you're not using it the way you need to. And so I think that's the mistake we're making in K-12 is we think just just call it, just go to four-year college and you're fine. That's not true. Really not true. I, I, I agree. I mean, I think there's within this subset now, I'm going to bifurcate again. You have, um, you have my oldest son who has a, a plan. Right. He's got a chemistry degree. He's going to go to law school. He uh, he wants to be a patent attorney and buy a bunch of fancy there cars you know. and maybe in a restaurant <laughs> one day. Right. Yeah. He, he had this planned out when he was 17 years old. My youngest, I I think, wants to, in some order, uh, play soccer and party his brains out and get to meet a bunch of people in college. And that's fair, too. Right. Like that's there are a lot of those students. How how can we um, how can we impress upon these students in, in a more impactful way that uh, t- to look at it as a as as a ROI, uh, to, yeah. to not do seventy five thousand dollars a year just to say you, you've got a cool bumper sticker on your car from from your college and go to football games. I mean, and, and that debt is a real problem, isn't it? It is a real problem. Um, I think that, uh, you know, and this is my philosophy in education across the board. So much of education historically has been sort of us telling young people what they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to know, what they're supposed to learn, as opposed to education being a discovery process where they we're we're um, playing on the natural curiosity of humans and we are creating an experience where they're um, engaging in things, reflecting on it, discovering things on their own. And so I think that this process is the same as what I want it to be in the classroom as I'm learning English and history. I want it to be a discovery, a journey. And we really think about it in three phases where you start with exposure. So there's just a huge amount of things that you're exposed to. And we're not doing nearly enough of this for our students. And this is where you can get into elementary and middle school. You can be doing exposure for a significant number of years, not the kind of exposure like, do you want to be a fireman or a nurse or a computer program, that's it. I'm, I'm talking like wide exposure. What do you like to do? What are your, we call them INGs, 
you know, the things you like doing and how might those come together in something in the future. So that starts at the beginning. And then you do um, exploration. So how do you do deeper dives? So this is where you would go do an internship or a shadow opportunity or, you know, a summer job. And, and there, learning what you don't like is just as valuable as learning what you do like. So you're sort of ruling things out and amplifying things. And then um, the pursuit is the next thing. And that really involves like, what are you going to pursue and making it concrete, creating a plan? You said your older son has a plan. And ultimately, every high school student can have a plan, maybe not as specific and, and long as your older son, but literally a plan of like, well, I know this about myself. And so this is what I'm going to do next. And, you know, we think about that in three ways, sort of you need to figure out after high school, where are you going to live? Where are you going to work? And where are you going to learn? There's sort of three parts to that. And four-year college is nice because it's a package deal. You kind of get all those things in one shot. Other These other pathways that are emerging, you kind of have to assemble the live, learn, work yourself and put it together, which makes it a little bit more challenging. And so that's where I do think coaching, counseling, and support is really helpful for students. Mike Tyson famously said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Exactly. And I tried to... I've tried to tell that to my son, like, don't be nailed down on a plan. You mm -hmm. might like something else along the way and, and, and let life happen uh, as opposed to just being fixated on one direction. And I, you know, I think about um, how our, our schools can start identifying students better. It, and, and when you start saying identifying, you start putting them on a track. And I feel like yeah. school districts and schools in, in America are kind of afraid to put kids on a track. We used to do that. Um, and maybe we did that in, in some cases to some students' peril, um, you know, misidentifying them as special needs perhaps, or, uh, or, or just misidentifying their, their skill set and generally. Do you, do you think that's still an issue that we're going to have to come to grips with to start tracking students towards different priorities? Uh I do think there's a bit of a reckoning given the history there because those tracks, um, as you said, um, I, I mean, they're, they're, they were um, socioeconomic and racially based tracks as well, where we really, you know, divert and gendered. Um, and so I, in, we don't want that anymore. I think a lot of people are um, rightfully fearful of this emerging movement around, you know, not college for all, but all these other pathways and opportunities. They're worried, oh my gosh, are we going back to the old days where we're just going to like, you know, uh, pigeonhole people into things? I don't believe that the future needs to be like the past. I am very cognizant of what the past was and how we need to not make those mistakes again. And so I think the key there is a few things. One, we don't decide though in the old system, the adults decided and students were sort of just um, put placed into them. The student, we actually empower the students to make their own decisions. And two, these pathways are not tracks anymore. They really do. They can be very fluid. And is, I, I love the idea of my, I'm not a Mike Tyson person, but I yeah. am a, um, I, there's this lovely book on leadership um, from the Cherokee Nation. And um, they talk about point A to point B, which is the name of my new organization. And really like leadership is simple. You know where you are, point A, you know where you're going, point B, you make a plan to get there and then you realize that plan is going to get interrupted. And so how are you going to come overcome those challenges and still get to your point B? And I think those are the modern day pathways. Like they're not these um, rigid tracks where, you know, if you don't make it or you don't like it, you're stuck. They really are these more fluid pathways where you sort of go, I think of them as like, you know, a pathway with pavers, you, you go to one paver. And if the next one in front of you isn't the right fit, you can go to the side and there's another one over there. And you can you can change pathways, bringing with you your skills and your knowledge experience to a multiple different set of, of doors. I, I also think we don't talk enough positively about two year colleges, you know, uh, what we called community colleges out in California, I am a proud, um, participant in that program um, before I went to the uh, elite institution of, of Chico State uh, <laughs> up the road from you. And, um, and, and I don't, you know, it, it almost feels like you're, uh, I don't want to say failure, but I think there's a stigma attached to community colleges to this day. Don't you, don't you sense that? And what can we do to yeah. note that better? 
Um, I completely agree with you. And I, I actually think that right now in our society, anything but four-year college feels like a lesser than option. And one of you know the things I'm really excited about and what I want to work on is how do we bring dignity back or I don't know if we ever had it, but how do we bring dignity to to two-year college options, these alternative pathway options, and to work that is suited for who we are? You know, I don't know why um, a desk job is perceived as a more dignified job than, let's say, an iron worker. I mean, the the job of an iron worker is very intense and skilled and risky and you know, a a really important job, but we have these perceptions in our society right now, I think largely linked to our perceptions of compensation and and money for these jobs that I'm not sure are accurate. And I think one of the things we collectively have to do in this next phase is bring dignity to all of these decisions because a community college decision is such a smart ROI decision, really. Like it's a brilliant decision Um, on so many levels. And I don't know why we're not recognizing and realizing that as a society yet. I I couldn't agree more. And I I feel like I'd like to see a list of famous people that have gone on, not only to community college, but have gone on to succeed wildly. You know, I I think of the uh, Green Bay Packers quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, right? He went to Butte, community college in Chico, California, famously. And he seems like he's done okay for himself. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, I wonder what are your thoughts on like successful programs that you've seen that, that give students some understanding of what they're, what they might be tracking towards and, and an understanding of, of all the options. I, I think it's really hard for a school district to a, a teacher, a high school teacher to explain, and I know this because I've gone into schools and walked them through how I got into first politics and then education. And, you know, when you, when you tell somebody you should get into politics, I think their first thinking is that they're, they're going to be giving speeches all day long. Um, somebody's got to write those speeches, right? Mm-hmm. And, and somebody's got to put those, uh, those speeches and those presentations up on the internet or share them with the world. So that's marketing. There are dozens and dozens of really cool jobs if you just say you like politics. And I, I don't know how a school can really, um, somebody who hasn't lived it can be as effective in telling students that, boy, are there are a lot of options. And you can say the same with Hollywood, right? Um, politics is Hollywood for ugly people. Well, Hollywood is is politics for good looking people. And <laughs> there's a million jobs in Hollywood that you never even think about because you just don't know until you go experience it. Well, I, I think you're identifying this very human problem that we all have, which is we, each of us has a very limited perspective about what exists in the world. And um, it, it doesn't matter how successful you are, how wealthy you are, your perspective is still quite limited. You just don't know about all of these possibilities. And mm-hmm. I don't think it's possible for a human to do that. You and I probably both know incredibly heroic high school counselors and, and career counselors who are doing their darndest to know every college in the the country, every possible job. It's not humanly possible. And I do think that sometimes we use technology in in not smart ways in education, but this is a place where technology really, really can play a role. Technology can actually come to know, if you will, all of these possibilities and, and enable students to discover them in really engaging ways, at least at the first level. There's always going to be a in-person component, if you will, or a you know human component to it. But for that first level of discovery, we need to be leveraging the power of technology so that every student has access to this full wide range of knowledge of what's possible and what's out there in the world and can play around with it and get some ideas around it and see how they might, you know, align with it. And so I I have yet to see us really leveraging the power of technology to support exactly what you're talking about. The other thing I'll just mention in there, technology is not biased the way humans are. And as hard as we try, we do these things in our mind, you know, we sort, we are like, well, you're one of those kind of kids, or, you know, this is what technology is not biased again. So they're, they're willing to show you anything and everything. Your book uh, was, I saw has been printed in eight languages mm-hmm. and it's being distributed all around the country. Why do you, why do you think it has such international appeal? Um, 
It's a good question. I talked to folks from around that. I was talking to some people from Taiwan earlier this week who are, who, who are really interested in it. Um, I think that um, a lot of countries around the world are um, trying to compete with and catch the U S if you will. And so they have really modeled their, you know, systems around um, sometimes the most successful students in their country are those who get accepted to an American university or are able to come to America. And so there is this sort of nuclear arms race on steroids that we experience in the U.S. around, you know, SATs and GPAs and what school you're getting into and applying to all of these colleges. And I think um, the book resonates because it, it really says, you know, actually the the pathway to success and a good life is not engaging in trying to be, you know, the same as everyone else, only better, but truly discovering who you are, what fills you up, what is exciting for you, what matters for you, and building these kind of universal skills that will serve you through life um, and doing it in a way that is enjoyable and um, and interesting and build on our, our natural human connections and relationships. And so I think that's the part that resonates. There's families and teachers across the planet who are like, what are we doing to our kids? They're, you know, at the worst end, killing themselves and at, at you know, a very high level right now, depressed, experiencing mental health issues. Like there's got to be a better way. I, I couldn't agree. I, I, I feel like the most depressed I've ever been in my life was when I was f newly married, didn't have a real f understanding of exactly what I was going to do and took some jobs just for the money. Right. It was it was soul crushing. And, mm -hmm. and, and then even more satisfying when I finally started doing what I wanted to do and having some success in it. It was the greatest sort of period yes. of my life. Of, of And I think that's what you mean by when you say f a fulfilling life in your book, it correct? A hundred percent. You know, there's sort of these five elements of a fulfilled life that are pretty universal. One is purposeful work, work that actually matches you and fills you up. Two is financial security, but it's not like making the most money in the world. It's like feeling financial secure, free from like, you know, a, a fragile existence or a crisis existence. Um, community is really important. Close personal relationships are really important and physical health. The ability to go about your daily life, um, you know, is real. Those are, those are basically the five elements of a fulfilled life. Diane Tavener, thank you so much. I, your, your book is called Prepared What Kids Need for a Fulfilled, fulfilled Life. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's still out there and people can get yes, a hold of it, Diane. Definitely. Fantastic. And you also have a podcast yourself called Class Disrupted. Tell me a little bit more about that. Um, I love it. It's so much fun. Uh, so it, right after the pandemic began, um, I, my friend Michael Horn and I um, got together to co-host a podcast. And uh, some folks might know Michael Horn. He wrote the, the book um, Disrupting Class. So our podcast is a bit of a play on that and um, has done a lot of work and research on how we can redesign our schools. And we both felt like the pandemic was going to be this opportunity to really reshape and redesign schools to better meet the needs of our students and our society and our future. And so we we didn't know back then that the pandemic would be as long as it was. And so we thought we would do 10 episodes kind of on key ways that we saw that schools could be redesigned. So we did that. It was, it was surprisingly popular. People liked it. They asked us to keep going. The pandemic kept going. And so we've just wrapped up our fourth season of Class Disrupted. And on that podcast, we really, um, we, we try to take the, current issues that are really facing schools. So what are they grappling with and dealing with? Um, and um, try to find third way solutions to them. You know, how might we move forward in not such a polarized way, but in a way that centers students and makes sense. And we also really feature how do you actually do redesign and innovation in schools? And so we'll get down in the nitty gritty of how you run pilots and how you actually transform things and feature people who are doing that. And, um, you know, that's certainly Michael's background from theory and my daily practice. And so it's pretty fun. It's a good conversation. And um, it's available on kind of all the normal places that you 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 find your podcasts. And so we welcome everyone to join us. I love it. Well, Diane Tavener, thank you so much from Point B. How can folks get a hold of you if they wanted to uh, reach out? Well, um, please reach out to us at um, my 
pointb.org and uh, you can reach me there. Very good. Thank you for your work and have a, have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on your favorite podcast platform. On the Clock is part of the Stratagos Podcast Network. To view the entire lineup of shows, please visit us at strategosgroup.com. See you next time.